Hi guys, this is the second video of our Spark Unique series. Today, we will be talking again about an example of a Spark job failure. And usually when you hear about problems with Spark, you hear about very large data sets. But this time it will be a little bit less intuitive because we will be talking about a data set which is very small, yet it causes problems. So small data causes big problems, but why exactly? Will it be something like the butterfly effect? Stick with me. So let's have a look at the Spark UI. And I deliberately do not show you the code because it's very common that you see a job which is long running on a cluster. You would like to figure out what's going on. You don't know where the code is, who is the owner, and so on. And that's exactly what we'll try to do here. We'll try to figure out as much as possible based on Spark UI only. So what do we have here? First of all, we have a job which has been running for quite some time. So we have to look here. And then we have a single stage, which is responsible for all that time. So we just go there. And there we can see something we've seen before. We can see many tasks which are completing with no time. And then there is this single task, which has been running for a very long time, which is basically responsible for all that runtime, which is preventing the job from completing so far. But that's not a surprise. We've seen that in the previous video. So let's see what we have if we look into the details of that task. The task is running and it's reading actually very small data. The data is very small, so it doesn't really explain why the job is so heavy, so long running. And if so, let's go to the SQL tab. Maybe we'll have more like there. Maybe we'll figure out some more details. So first thing we can see is that we are reading 2.5 million records in total. So this is nothing. This doesn't explain anything. And then it's always worth looking into the exchange because it tells us some critical details about our execution plan. We have the exchange based on order ID and it actually goes both ways. And what's interesting, it actually merges back together eventually. So that's the first hint for us of what is happening. We have some order table, we join it with itself based on the order ID. And then another interesting fact is that we are producing billions of records. And that is kind of explaining why we are running for such a long time. And at the same time, if we merge all that information together, we are reading from order table, we self join it with based on order ID. We are reading not many records, but we are producing a lot, which leads us to a conclusion that we are, the number of records is exploding. We are doing self join with many to many relationships. So let me show you exactly what is happening and how to solve these kind of problems. So why are we doing the cross join in the first place? One of the very common use cases for that is shopping cart analysis. So let's say we try to understand which products are often bought together in our e-commerce. And the way the schema looks like is that we have as many records as the line items in the order. And if we want to have all the product pairs, we can do the self-join. So how exactly the join is performed? Spark organizes the records into buckets, as I showed you in the previous video, and respective buckets from the left and right hand side are going to the same task. So the task is creating a new record with the result of, of the join for, let's say, order ID one. And all that is good as long as it's one to one relationship. Actually, Spark from version three can handle many to one relationship very well, even if the data is skewed. But if we have many to many relationship with 
significant skew, then we might have a problem. And in this case, we are dealing with self join and the product of that is growing very, very fast. So if we have three records in the, in the input for the single order, then the result will be nine records. 10 in the input means 100 in the output, but 10K in the input means the output will be 100 million and it will be very likely too much for a single executor. And you add one more zero and it's definitely too much. So how do we handle that? Quite common idea is salting. So when we join the three records of a product table with itself, based on the order ID, it will produce nine records. And all of them will be processed in one executor because we are joining based on the order ID and the order ID is exactly the same for all three records. And let's say the nine records created by a single task is for some reason too much for our executor. And let's say we would like to artificially split the producing of nine records into two separate tasks instead of one. So the trick is that we add a salt column where we put a random number, random integer one or two, because we are splitting it into only two tasks. And that what is happening on the table on the left-hand side. In the table on the right-hand side, we add an every single possible salt value. So we duplicate the records and then we join not only by the order ID, but also by the salt value. So these two records have the same value of order ID and salt, and they will be joined with these three records of the table on the right hand side. And this task will produce two multiplied by three equals to six records. And similar thing will happen with salt value two. So one record multiplied by three means three records will be produced by the second task. So end of the day, the result will be exactly the same. We'll produce nine records, but the calculation will be distributed into two different executors. And if we want to distribute more, we can just increase the salt value. And keep in mind, this can be improved. First of all, the process I described is, it produces the, the same pair of, of the product twice. Other than that, this is kind of a shotgun approach. It is possible to identify which orders are very heavy and to do the salting for them only. And last but not least, this is a Cartesian join. It's not that we can do some magic to, to avoid the heavy lifting. The result will be very large. The heavy lifting has to happen. But what we actually doing here, we are parallelizing the work and that prevents us from getting stuck with single task, which is running for a very long time. That prevents us from getting stuck with out of memory, disk quota problems and so on. So I just wanted to remind you what I already mentioned in the previous video. Before you jump into salting, make sure this is really the logic you want to implement. Maybe the SKU is a bug or maybe you can just filter it out and that will be just much simpler. But OK, let's have a look at what changed after the fix, after adding the salting. So first of all, the job completes after 14 minutes, which is a great improvement compared to over an hour before. And then if you look into the details, you can see that the top stage, the stage where the heavy lifting is happening, is taking 13 minutes. And in that stage, the tasks, if you look at the event timeline, the tasks are more evenly distributed. So there are many tasks which are participating in doing the heavy lifting now. Before, we had just a single task, which was a blocker for the entire job. So that's exactly what we wanted to achieve. And if we want to 
scroll down, we can see that the top task is running for 13 minutes, which is still not, not perfect because if we compare it, compare it to the other one, we can see that they are much shorter. So we have to still wait for this single task to complete. We can improve that, but let's skip that for now. Let's go into the details into the SQL tab. And in the SQL tab, we can see the execution plan. So first of all, we can see that when we read the data, the, the parquet data, we do some transformations here. So we do the random number generation. And the salt value I have selected with just 18 is just an arbitrary call. Right now, we are not uh, creating a perfect job. We are creating a job which is good enough. So that's one side of the join. And then we do the exchange by order ID and salt ID. On the other side of the join, we generate every single possible salt value. So we have 18 values to generate. We join that to the 2.5 million records of the input data. We generate a record with every single possible salt value. So the 2.5 million becomes 45 million. So we have now right-hand side table generated, the left-hand side generated, and we do the join. We do the join based on, once again, order ID and the salt. And we are still producing billions of record. So we still are producing very large number of records, and that's that's the logic. We cannot really do much about that. There is lots of heavy lifting here, but the heavy lifting has been distributed now because the values the of different values of, of the salt can be processed by, by different executor. And going back to, to the job, if we look at the event timeline. Here, we can see that after some time, the executors are being removed because they have not much to do anymore. And that is something which can be, which can be improved. We still have this single executor, which is significantly um, heavier than, than the other ones. And other than that, in, in the tasks, in the, in the task details, we can see that the tasks are actually producing quite many records. We could think about improving that. It all depends on the number of executors we have and what exactly we are optimizing for. And if you'd like to hear about that, let me know. Let me know in the comments. I would be very happy to record a video about that. And also, please let me know what other subjects would you like me to cover into in the videos which are about to come. Thank you very much.